Paul Vadiato, who bring you more than a combined 25 years of practical experience, helping thousands of family caregivers, helping them find solutions to the challenges and frustrations presented by this important responsibility. So if you are in the position of caring for a spouse or a parent, a loved one who is no longer able to care for themselves, or if you know someone who is, this hour will be worth the listening. Now, let's tune in to today's edition of Caregiver Reality with your hosts, David Levy and Paul Vadiato. Good evening, South Florida, America, and the world. If I sound a little nasal today, it's because I've had a bad cold the last five or six days, but the show must go on, so here I am, even though I'm wearing a sleeveless sweater. Um, you're hearing us on iHeartRadio, I trust, WWNN, 1470 AM here in South Florida, WWNNRadio.com, CaregiverReality.com, Amp2.TV. Dot com. And so we've just dot comed everybody that we know, and eventually it will be out there worldwide. We're trying to figure out exactly how it gets out to all the places that it does, but it does. And uh, our producer, Freddie, brings us panels every week that show what our demographics are. And our market is uh, roughly 35 to 65 plus. Can't tell you exactly because they don't go over 65, so I would be counted as 65 plus. Um, maybe even Paul these days, I'm not sure, um, because he'll never tell. <laughs> like Miss <laughs> Clarell. Right. <laughs> but we do know that our listeners and our watchers are listening and watching for somewhere in the neighborhood of about 35 minutes, which we think is excellent, and probably the commercials that we can't control on our site and all of the others so when you get the dancing oreos and the peanut butter tacos that talk to you most people cut away um, <laughs> one day we'll control that and you'll be able to watch all the way through and no interruptions but uh, for the moment we are the victims of the media but we are glad to be here and as i say every week at this time paul well, good afternoon, David, and good afternoon to all of our listeners. We're here with Typhoid Mary here, and all hoping that we don't go home with the flu. <laughs> uh, but David is with us. My week in caregiving was uh, not a particularly great week. Uh, those problems continue to mount. We were back to the doctors. Uh, there's a wonderful medication called prednisone, which is sort of boosts the immune system, but it is just so horrible to take. So it's been a difficult week for, for my bride, and uh, conversely, it's been a difficult week mm -hmm. for myself, but we're going to get through it. David, I know you not only had a problem this week with your health, but your and beautiful and bride as well. And wasn't good as well, and, uh, and I know, <coughs> excuse me, and so I was, she was my caregiver. You know, it's a very funny thing. When you actually become sick and you're the alpha caregiver, then... The person who you're normally taking care of feels they must rise to the occasion no matter what it is. That's right. And she went on chicken soup patrol because mine was only a bad cold. And um, and so we, I was very lucky in that respect. She had a tough week, but um, <coughs> we have a floor that has to be replaced. And uh, the tile came up. And so she is in the process of trying to figure out how to pack all those pictures, China, <laughs> little tchotchkes that we've had since World War II and uh, get them all safely packed away, marked, and marched out to the garage. Moving on. <laughs> Moving on. Right. My bloodhound was a great help with this. I understand from Kenny, for one of the first times in a long time, we have a caller on the air. His name is Carl. Carl, are you there? Carl? Hi. Yes, Paul. This is uh, Carl. This is our Olsen. guest. Oh, 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 oh. I'm sorry. Um, hi, Carl. David Levy here. Hey there. How are you? I'm fine. Um, well, let me give a little bit of an introduction on you, Carl. Um, and I thank you for calling in. Uh, my mistake, I thought we had another Carl. All right. So just hold on a moment. Carl, uh, okay. It's is it Oswede? Yes. That's the correct oh. way to pronounce it. Completed his surgery residency at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital. 
before joining the Mainline Health System and Lakenau <coughs> Medical Center, where he practiced in the Department of Cardiac Surgery. While caring for these patients, Dr. Oswald developed an appreciation for the difficulties encountered by patients and their families when faced with end-of-life issues and curable chronic diseases. He's a fellow of the American College of Surgeons and was recognized by the American Board of Surgery in 2009 as one of the first surgeons to become board certified in hospice and palliative medicine. He currently serves as the medical director for palliative care at Mainline Health Systems. Now, that's a bit of a jump doctor uh, from cardiac surgeon to palliative care doctor. And um, so we're going to be very excited to hear about it. Also, we have back with us Antonella Martino, who's a PhD consultant pharmacist. She's with the Health Consultancy Pharmacists of America. And um, she does everything that pharmacists do, but more. But she's also uh, with a PhD, uh, gives great oversight information and helps others to understand and win their way through the pharmaceutical world, which Paul was just lauding over the prednisone that his wife had. No, he isn't. Um, <laughs> no, but without no. any further ado, <laughs> and knowing that I see Carl on the phone. Yes. All right, Paul, why don't you pick it up from there? Yes, thank you. Uh, I want to speak from my perspective, if I may, a little bit today, David. Uh, I remember not that many years ago, one never said the word cancer out loud uh, as it was considered almost a taboo but today we've removed a lot of that stigma and the fear and we've come to realize that you can't catch cancer just by saying the word we see a lot of research that is being done we see a lot of uh, support we see a lot of program we see dollars time treasure and talent that is being spent to help both people with cancer and the research and a lot of good, positive, worthwhile changes came as a result of th that word cancer being more accepted. However, if we were to substitute uh, mental illness instead of cancer, we get an entirely different picture. We don't like it, we don't want to hear about it, we don't want to be near it, and unfortunately we don't support it in the same way as we do with, uh, with cancer. Uh, you know, it's like asking someone in a room with everyone who's a drug addict to uh, raise your hand, and no one wants to do that. And we seem to pick and choose which of those illnesses are good diseases that we can talk about, and which of those diseases are not so good, and we should stay away from that. It's sort of like going to a cocktail party and talking religion and politics. People become a little bit uncomfortable. But from my perspective, my dear listeners, this mm -hmm. needs to change because there are just too many people with a variety of mental health challenges and their family and their caregivers are really struggling. Uh, recently, Robin Williams passed uh, yes. and uh, the, a lot was written about him, about his life and his, his challenges with depression. And other than his wife, they say that nobody knew that this was an issue with him and he's one of our national treasures but you know it really does beg the question why not i mean why why was the list that of of symptoms that they had not picked up by so many other people and help gotten to them uh the the list of mental health diseases is long it's non-discriminatory they run in good families they run in not so good families but in the end, they're very real, they are very hurtful, not only for the person who's going through it, but also for the caregiver as well. So over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about mental, il mental health with a number of subject matter experts. We're going to take a look at mental health the same way that we look at physical health, because the law actually says that we cannot discriminate between a physical health issue and a mental health issue and we know in reality it really doesn't come down that way and we're going to even talk about that with some of these experts along the way which brings me to the campaign that we started earlier this year engage to change advocate advocate for the caregiver worldwide and we think this is a great place to start and mm -hmm. we need you you who are listening to us and you who are watching us 
We need your voice. We need your anger. We need your commitment. It's a call to action. Please email me at paul at caregiverreality.com. All you need to say is, I'm engaged. The more we get, the faster we're going to get to our goal of getting heard on that. Please do it today. It's just simply the right thing to do. David? I think you're absolutely correct. And I would once again rephrase the question that I, that I did to the doctor. Doctor, what made the, uh, I, I hate to use the word, paradigm shift from being an active, invasive cardiologist uh, to being uh, a palliative care doctor? What was, what was the aha moment for you? Well, I, I, in a way, I, I, I view surgery as a as a field that is caring for the whole patient. Uh, I think that the uh, and so I, I don't really see that it's a huge jump from surgery into palliative care. I was practicing palliative care uh, the minute I became a doctor and uh, and was training in my surgery. But but really, what was happening is why I why I shifted my focus away from the operating room into the. Uh, into the field of advanced care planning, which is really what my, where my real passion lays, is that um, I saw a lot of, I, I was doing a lot of family meetings uh, in the intensive care unit on patients with their families. Uh, generally, the patients were not able to participate in the, in the family, in the discussion. And uh, I was, I, I noticed and I, I realized that uh, the advanced care planning uh, that had been, that had taken place, which basically was a document that was uh, an advanced directive or a living will that was filled out in a lawyer's office uh, prior to their hospitalization, was of uh, very little benefit uh, in the practical sense in the intensive care unit. And what I saw was I saw a lot of suffering from the families because they were having to make decisions that they were not really clear about what their their loved one's wishes were. And um, and for me, it was, uh, I literally said for about four years, uh, some doctor really should uh, really focus on this as, mm-hmm. as, as, as a, uh, a specialty. And I think that things could change if a, if a doctor who really was passionate about it and who really wanted to uh, ch- make some effective change would get involved, we could really see some uh, positive results. And then uh, finally I turned that, turned that question around and said, well, why don't you be that doctor? Yeah. And, um, and that's, um, that's what I did. Uh, Carl, just so that everyone understands exactly what is palliative care, what does it mean uh, and as opposed to end-of-life planning? Um, palliative care is uh, is a very broad term. It's basically relief of distress. Uh, it means to palliate, to uh, relieve or soothe, and so that can re- that that really entails a great deal of of uh, modalities. I I was practicing palliative care every time I wrote a prescription for pain medication after performing surgery. Um, but so the the palliative care is basically symptom management, some uh, relief of distress. And that can be physical distress such as pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, delirium, uh, things like that. Um, but the one one aspect I think that is often neglected in medical training and in the medical system as a whole is the existential anxiety that patients and their loved ones feel mm-hmm. as they're aging, mm-hmm. as their uh, diseases progress. And uh, they really want to have a discussion about where is this all going to go and, and what do we do under uh, certain circumstances. And we're just not, we, we haven't really set things up to, to deal with that. And, um, and basically, because hospice care or end-of-life care is, is strictly palliative care uh, near the end of life, I think there's a there's a misconception that palliative care is is the, is equivalent to hospice care. Uh, hospice care is palliative care, but palliative care is more than just hospice care. Yeah, I think that's an interesting distinction, Doctor. Did you happen to see on the internet or read if you were you were near one, uh, the New York Times yesterday on Sunday rather? Um, I do not know. I, okay. I, I did not read it uh, per se. I, I often uh, see these articles after they they hit the palliative uh, medical board. Well, uh, this this so. was one about a doctor who went out of his way 
recognizing that if he got dementia, and he was speaking mm -hmm. in terms of Alzheimer's, but I think he was speaking of dementia in general, uh, mm -hmm. that he put in very, very strict instructions. It was, uh -huh. don't even feed me sure. if I'm right. feedable. Uh, right. Don't hydrate me even if I'm capable of being hydrated orally and uh, obviously not, not in terms of having a, a tube in his arm and went out of his way to make sure that everything that was capable of being done to prevent him having to put his family through the end stage of Alzheimer's and himself as well even though he may not have cognitive awareness he certainly was a human still with a brain even if he couldn't communicate and his senses and could certainly feel or at least in his mind that a lot of this was serious enough for him to say I don't want it in any form or shape just let me go as quickly as possible and all of a sudden all of the um, do no harm and the ethical folks, and I have great respect for them, came jumping out and said, oh, how can you do that? And mm -hmm. um, having just lived with a friend of mine whose wife went through this and was on the show about a year ago, and he could find no one to help her in end-stage Parkinson's as she was really suffering um, mm -hmm. to do anything about it, he, he's been a great contributor of information to me on this subject, and I'm just wondering... Um, as a palliative care doctor, uh, how do you feel about somebody saying, hey, I'm not even interested in, in the end point. Don't even let me get there if I don't have to, and especially if I'm not capable of calling that shot due to dementia. Well, I, I certainly admire his, uh, his, for, his, his autonomy. I mean, all of us have that autonomy to say, what what do we want done when we're unable to communicate and uh, and our wishes should be followed and i think that he is leading a demonstration which is extremely important to do and i think he's doing a great service for his family um by being very clear about what to do uh this way they can be relieved of guilt when he or at least alleviated of some guilt uh when he does decline uh physically uh, if he was to uh, suffer dementia. Now, as a, as a palliative care physician, I'm also w well in support of if his wishes were to say, I want absolutely everything done until my mm -hmm. heart stops beating, uh, mm -hmm. and I want every machinery and, and life support given to me. And uh, as, a, as a physician, I support both, uh, both stances, and, and I would work very hard to make sure that he got his wish, and if somebody had an opposing wish, that we would do the same for, for, for that person as well. Let, let me ask you one other question. I, I don't want to be the dominant person in this conversation. But when you look at that, and all of a sudden there are third parties that come out of the woodwork, and we saw a lot of that here in Florida with <coughs> Terry Schiavo a few years ago, and all uh -huh. of a sudden there are people kind of foisting upon others, and not in a negative sense, but their ethical standards and what bioethics is supposed to stand for. And I recognize that the Hippocratic Oath of do not hasten, do no harm, uh, is one that's often cited, but yet I think, and, and you may be able to tell me whether I'm right or wrong, the Hippocratic Oath is not a condition of getting your medical license. Uh, nor is it a condition to graduate from medical school. It is a philosophy that's been handed down for thousands of years and one which the medical profession subscribes to but is not mandated to follow. Would that be correct or am I missing something? I'm sorry, I, I missed the last part. It is I not said it's something that we have followed, the, the Hippocratic Oath, but is it anywhere in licensure or is a condition of graduating from medical school mandated that you must follow the Hippocratic Oath? No, no it isn't. There's no mandate about that. And, and I, I, view the, uh, I think with everything that the, the Hippocratic Oath has, has, uh, has its place, uh, but uh, when you say do no harm, and I think that's the most common part of the Hippocratic Oath that is quoted, 
Um, and I, I, to tell you the truth, I'm not even sure that that's in the Hippocratic Oath. I, 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 I did say it at my medical school graduation, but I couldn't recite it today. Okay. But, <laughs> but, uh, but I look at it that, uh, you know, I see extended medical care given to patients that do not want that medical care as harm. Uh, so I think the, the harm needs to be defined in the, by the patient, and I believe that just like religion, just like your political uh, uh, desires, uh, that, that we need to respect people who have different opinions than, our, than, our, than ourselves, and, uh, and we need to support them. Thank um, you. Uh, in you that. So. No, I'm good. Um, Paul? Yeah. Uh, Carl? What are the statistics of, of people who want to have this kind of discussion, people who actually do, people who have nothing and, you know, find themselves in this circumstance? Where do we stand? Um, I think at the present time, I think the latest surveys that I saw was that the, in, in average, on average, 30% uh, of Americans have filled out an advanced directive. Now, in my estimation, most of those advanced directives are very limited in their abilities to help in a um, mm -hmm. end-stage end condition in a uh, in a hospitalized setting. I um, the I think that there is probably less than one percent of the of the population that have gone through the more extensive advanced care planning uh, with a, with a better document. Uh, sharing those feelings with their family and sharing those uh, feelings and goals with their health care provider. Uh, I think that's a very, very low percentage for, for those people. Versus how many who say that they really are definitive about their choices but never really have the discussion? Well, that, there, is, there are some it. pretty nice surveys that are done by, um, that were done by Dartmouth Atlas Project who, that stated that 80% of people with chronic medical conditions, people with heart failure, lung, uh, lung issues, kidney failure, things like that, that uh, had a condition that they were likely to die from, 80% of them said that they did not want to die in the hospital, yet nationwide 55% of them did. All right. Doctor, that, that, those are phenomenal mm -hmm. statistics. Yeah. And please hold on because uh, we really let time run away with us a little bit and we need to take a station break, but just Okay. Hold on, we're going to be back. We have a lot more to ask you, and, and thank you for your candor and your forthrightness so far. I think it's very, very refreshing to hear that from somebody in the medical profession. Let's go to our station break, and we'll be back in a couple of minutes. Are you a family caregiver? Are you taking care of a spouse or loved one who can no longer take care of himself or herself? Are you dealing with Alzheimer's disease and don't know what to do? Do you feel burned out, frustrated, and just don't know where to turn? You've tried doctors, lawyers, and mental health professionals and have come to realize that they don't have practical answers to these questions. What you need are experts, non-clinical family caregivers, with 25 years of active experience helping thousands of family caregivers like yourself. People who can help you provide a better quality of life for yourself and your loved one. Who you need are David Levy or Paul Vadiato. Reach David at david at caregiverreality.com or reach Paul at paul at caregiverreality.com and let them help you pick the right path towards improving the quality of life for you, the caregiver, and your loved one. Hello, South Florida, America, and the world. This is David Levy, co-host on the Caregiver Reality Hour and talking to you live from South Florida. We have a show that no one should miss because we're talking to 50 million caregivers in the United States and probably 100 million around the world. It's an opportunity to hear what the experts have to say and more importantly, if you realize that the market for caregiving is as enormous as it is, you should get in touch with us because we're looking for certain select advertisers that want to be part of the caregiver reality. And those of you that want to be part of the caregiver reality family, get in touch with us, David at caregiverreality.com, Paul at caregiverreality.com. We'll get back to you because this is too important in your marketing to miss. 
This is Caregiver Reality with gerontologist David Levy and caregiver expert Paul Vadiato, who ask you to call in and speak with them on the air toll-free at 888-565-1470. That's 888-565-1470 to share a story or important information. Now, back to today's Caregiver Reality Show. Hi, caregivers of the world. We're back. And we've been having a fascinating conversation with Carl Oswald, uh, a medical doctor, formerly a surgeon, who is now a palliative care doctor. We were discussing the fact that possibly only 35% of those in this country, or possibly that was a worldwide statistic, but I, I just don't see it in third world countries for the moment, uh, do not document their requests for end of life with advanced directives designating a health care surrogate and so forth. Many of them just take something off the shelf. It's not uh, de defined for them and it gets into things like, you know, if, if I'm no longer capable of functioning, you know, and then you're into this whole interpretive thing of, of what does that really mean? But lately, doctor, and, and in just uh, in, in touching back with that article that was in the New York Times, I have begun to see here in Florida much more substantive additions to, durable, to advanced directives that really get into points of if I have dementia, if I have incurable Parkinson's and other diseases like that, if it's possible, I want to be moved to a state that will allow assisted suicide. I want to be able to be taken out of the country to a, a, a venue that might allow me to have a, a quick and more expedited passing. And while mm -hmm. it isn't necessarily a point of the law, it's becoming a big point of issue with many, many people who have gone through exactly what you're talking about, an end of life with a loved one, and say, that's not for me. And you're absolutely right. The difficulty of getting it honored in a facility or, or almost anywhere is very difficult against the balance of litigation and what does it really mean and shouldn't we really be doing more than what we are so um i thank you for helping to bring that subject up because it's one that's that's on the top of my mind that has to have something done to it uh antonella our phd pharmacist you have a question to ask or a position to take on this issue uh yes i just like to basically um share that um as a consultant pharmacist and a doctor we probably have similar uh, challenges in coordination of care and educating both you know the patients and the families uh, regarding you know their conditions and their medications they're taking so maybe um, if you could share um, how difficult it is um, to manage some of this um, patients therapies and if there are any issues and maybe way to improvement for uh, medications dispensing and and issues with that. Um, boy, that's, if uh, any, it's a broad topic. Yeah, it's a it's it's a very it's a very tough subject. I um, <laughs> I'm actually I was a pharmacist before I went to medical school, and so mm -hmm. I um, so I can speak to to it to, to some degree. But I I do believe that it it really goes into. Um, back to uh, a lot of discussions about what does what do the patients really want and mm -hmm. I think that we really need to be a lot more uh, um, cognizant about what the patient's goals are because I think that mm -hmm. when I have a lot of discussions with patients um, what ends up happening is we end up uh, actually stopping a lot of medications because uh, the continuation of those medications are really not what the what the patient would really want right. um, and uh, so I think that, I, I basically, I think the answer to your question is much, much more conversation, mm -hmm. much, much more involvement, which, if, which is almost next to, uh, it's very, very difficult to, um, to attain in, in this fast-paced world of medical sure. care. Okay. What medications re must stay in a palliative care situation, doctor? 
must mm. stay there. I, I don't think that there is any um, there's any musts in palliative care. I think that uh, one of the things that we uh, we just have to respond to whatever situation that we are uh, we are presented with. Um, uh, certainly, when I am in the intensive care unit at, at a hospital and I'm removing somebody from life support, um, the, the, there's a certain subset of medications that are extremely important, mainly the opiates for breathing, mm-hmm. um, as well as uh, some anticholinergics uh, for secretion control, things like that, um, and 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 uh, any medications for anxiety are important because uh, there can be a lot of fear that's associated with this transition. Doctor, when I had the uh, pleasure of sharing a podium with you in Philadelphia last month, uh, you presented what I thought was a tremendous uh, presentation, and you spoke about six questions that you created in helping a family to decide. Can you go over those six questions and why they are so important? Well, yes, what we did was uh, at Mainline Health, we... um, are trying to are, are trying to develop a uh, a form that um, while it's not the same as a two hour long conversation with a physician doing an advanced care plan, mm-hmm. we need to get more information than what was on the standard advanced directives. Most of the standard advanced directives do not take uh, do not uh, become effective until the patient is almost near death. Uh, so. What we wanted to do is we wanted to add <clears throat> simple questions that are fairly easy to understand that um, would be very powerful in guiding medical care um, uh, both to the families who are the surrogate decision makers and to the clinicians taking care of the patients who uh, the, the patients in question. Um, and I think that uh, um, uh, they basically will define in, in uh, fairly specific terms, what level of disability is acceptable to the patient and what level of disability is unacceptable, uh, because that is the that is the, the the line in patient autonomy that is different for everybody. And doctor, you made them available to our listeners. If they write into Paul at caregiverreality dot com, we may send them a copy of those six questions. Yes, absolutely. And I, my suggestion for I, I practice in the state of Pennsylvania, and what we what I suggest is uh, that in most states, the advanced directives that I have uh, encountered leave an area for patients to write in their values or mm-hmm. their goals. And these are the, the these answers to the six questions. I think uh, would be very helpful in any advanced directive to give it more weight and to give it more power and to and to and to make it more actionable in in a clinical situation. Doctor, have you developed as you have become more proficient in in palliative care end of life? Is and I know every situation is a fingerprint, but um, have you come upon any any mantra? <laughs> as it were, or a set of words that helps you to to get into that conversation more comfortably with families that, that know that they're facing some very tough tough sledding with their loved one. Good question. Yeah. But, but yet uh, are looking to you not only for guidance on the medical side, mm-hmm. but maybe some palliative care for them as well. Well, I think that what I the, the way I approach it uh, is to really to basically not pick on the patient per se, but to really approach it when I'm seeing a patient in the hospital or seeing somebody uh, as an outpatient. I am saying that this is the sort of thing that we all need to do. Uh, I my belief is is that but when you turn 18. You need to have these sorts of discussions. Your family's needs to know your wishes. So we are just going to do that for you. You just may be further along uh, in your disease process than other people, but I believe that everybody needs to have these discussions. And that takes the, I think it takes the, uh, maybe the, 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 the sting that, oh, we're talking about at the end of life here, because basically I'm not really talking about the end of life. I'm really talking about what are your values, and everybody has them. And I did, that's all I want to know is what are your values. So well, I think that's a much. I think that's a much easier point mm. to pivot on yeah. than simply saying do this, don't do that. Mm. 
if I reach a point in your medical wisdom that, you know, I've gone over whatever that dividing line is that attorneys have put in a document. And right. I, I, think, I think adding the value system, and I'm sure that's what the six questions plus some blank lines underneath it, allow mm -hmm. someone to have a, a, a better understanding, especially if they're the one trying to interpret the document on behalf of themselves as a professional and on behalf of the family mm -hmm. who may just walk in with the document and say, here, this is what my father wanted. Right. Well, and I think that I, I think that everybody wants to fill out those documents uh, to give information to their loved ones. I just think that they don't know how to they don't know the answer, the questions that need to be answered and that and that's what we i'm very i'm just really thrilled by these six questions because i found that i think that they're fairly simple but they're they're very very useful in being able to tell us just where the patient would want to want to be under certain circumstances well it sounds like it's very powerful yeah. paul uh, yeah. we have the uh, affordable care act now it's it's rolling along into 2015 uh, what changes do you see ahead under the Affordable Care Act in terms of palliative care and getting physicians uh, up to speed and compensated for having these discussions? I, I'm, I really am. I, I cannot speak to what, what is going to happen. I, I, I know there's a lot of speculation as to how the Affordable Care Act is going to work, and I, I think there's going to be emphasis on, on advanced care planning because um, it, it's, it's shown to be most effective, the best cost savings, and it gives the patients and their families what they want uh, and gives them the satisfaction as well. The concern I have is that... Um, that, that what's going to happen is that uh, a, a small amount of money is going to be presented to physicians who do not really know how to do an advanced care planning. And uh, my concern is, is that we may not be much further ahead than we were than we are right now. Uh, so I, that's the that's the one concern I have is that I I view uh, and I. This is my surgical background coming through. It's like I view one of these advanced care planning sessions every bit as difficult from a physical and emotional standpoint as when I was doing surgery. And I think it should be compensated as such. Uh, and, uh, and it needs to be as robust. It cannot be something that can be done in a 15-minute uh, office visit. Is it something that should be added to the medical school agenda? I mean, did you have anything that looks like what you're talking about when when you went to Jefferson? I, well, not not specifically, but uh, I think that I'm I, I'm not I'm not reinventing the wheel here. Basically, what I'm doing is I'm looking at the clinician. I, I'm following the clinicians that uh, that that paved a, a wonderful path for me, and I'm just following along with them. But I think that one of the um, uh, the one physician that uh, was a pulmonary specialist uh, what he did with his with all of his patients is he said when you get to the age of 65 excuse me um, I want you and all of your family to come in here and we're going to have a discussion about because you're you if you're a patient of mine Good one stuff. of these yeah. days you're going to wind up on a ventilator and we want to know mm -hmm. what do you want to do and he would have these discussions okay. document them yeah. and when his family and when his patient showed up in the hospital everybody knew what to do and that was that's essentially what what we, i would love to see all the doctors doing but mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately it's not emphasized right now in um in the curriculum and in the payer system. Right. That, right. That's part right. of something that Paul's brought forward called the Conversation Project and Death Over Dinner, where after Thanksgiving, hopefully you don't pass away, <laughs> but the family <laughs> has that perfect opportunity right. um, to sit down and hear what the relative needs, wants, desires, and as you mm -hmm. say, values of, of mm -hmm. the, the pertinent members of the family who have to act on those documents or in the absence of it do their best to try and interpret what they may want notwithstanding you know HIPAA and uh, and and also trying to wend your way through do not hasten um, right. but I'm, I'm really excited to see the six questions I know that 
Paul had them. I asked him for them, and he said, no, you have to write in to me and, and get them. So I suggest to everybody, uh, because I want to know, too, is that you get a hold of Paul at caregiverreality.com. I love getting mail. Right. And, and get a copy of these, because I think... They're critical. Right. Just like uh, The Four Wishes was an early example of trying to express yourself in advance of a more formal uh, advanced directive that these value-based uh, statements uh, sound like they are a great bedrock for then wending or weaving its way into a more formal advanced directive that can be honored, you know, in the state of wherever you, you produce it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, yeah I, I, I really admire everybody who's doing the conversation projects and the death cafes, death dinners. Um, and the five wishes uh, is a is a great document. I think that the 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 only thing that I I want to do is I want to finish the conversation and I want it documented so that there's some hard and fast facts or and and that's the thing that I I I'm hoping can happen. And um, while the six questions I'm sure is not perfect, it is I, I believe it, it's a it's a powerful tool and a fairly simple tool to use that 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 would be helpful. Doctor, looking at the other side of the telescope, for those that are not going to go that route, uh, I heard some ridiculous numbers as to what the health care costs in the last six months of life when all of the machines are rolled out. Can you speak to that for a second when we're all trying to figure out budgets? <laughs> Including <laughs> Medicare. I think, I think, yeah. <laughs> I think there's a lot of discussion about this, and, and I, I can't say that advanced care planning is going to alleviate that there's a lot of money spent at the end of life. Uh, but I do know that one of the things that happens uh, uh, is that um, uh, spending at the end of life uh, is different in a geographical location. Mm -hmm. And uh, generally speaking, the more urban areas uh, spend a great deal of, mo of, of money. Uh, I think the 2010 data had Manhattan being the most expensive for the last six months of life, spending about $76,000 on average in the last six months of life, whereas Dubuque, Iowa, spent $26,000 in the last six months of life. And they had equivalent rates of mortality. So it wasn't like the $76,000 being spent in Manhattan was was keeping these people alive longer. Um, and so, what it, the 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 the, uh, the uh, conclusion to this is, patients' values have less importance than where they end up being cared for when they're uh, elderly and sick. And um, I think that is the, that's the tragedy that that really I, we need to try to to solve. I believe. I don't think we're going to necessarily wipe away the, the cost of uh, care at the end of life. That is when people get sick. That's when it's going to be, uh, there's a lot of money that's going to be spent at it. Spent. Mm -hmm. but I think that we need to be a little bit more consistent, and, and if we can give the people what they want, we mm -hmm. probably will be spending less money. Right. Okay. Here in Florida, Doctor, we have uh, many of our caregivers are long distance. Uh, mm -hmm. Why don't you speak a little bit to the long-distance caregivers and as it applies to palliative care and making these decisions when they're not there to watch them? Um, boy, I, I know that they have a very, very tough, uh, tough situation. I, I see in my inpatient uh, consultation service at, uh, at Mainline Health, um, we have a lot of uh, patients who have uh, loved ones who live outside the area who are mm -hmm. caring for their patients generally with the, with their loved ones generally with dementia and uh, and I think that unfortunately they have um, uh, it, it's very difficult to stay on top of, uh, of everything um, and, uh, uh, and and really understand just exactly what's going on with their loved one I, uh, I don't have a solution for it I um, but I, I've seen unfortunately a lot of care being given to patients with advanced dementia uh, being asked for by people who are a number of states away uh, because basically out of guilt because they, they don't want to stop treatment if they're not right there and so they ask us to continue treatment um, when they uh, show up uh, oftentimes uh, we end up stopping 
the life lengthening treatments and focus on comfort care. And uh, it's just it's just sort of sad that uh, that uh, the the patients had had to go through that just be, just because of the the guilt of saying no I I, I, I want to uh, I would want to switch to comfort care from a distance. Let me say something. Doctor, uh, first of all, this has been a fascinating conversation. Oh, all excellent. Right? But, <clears throat> and I know that your friend, the pulmonologist, mm -hmm. demanded that they come in once the patient turned 55. But you made a very interesting remark earlier that when somebody reaches their majority, whether it's 18 or 21, depending upon where you are, um, you need to be able to say the same kinds of things. Sometimes we don't get to a ripe old age uh, in terms of illness and disease or accident uh, mm -hmm. before we need, unfortunately, to have, or fortunately, mm -hmm. to have the use of advanced directives. So I, I, I would just point out, and I'm sure you do all the time, that this is not just an age-related issue to aging. It's anybody who finds themselves, for whatever the reason and whatever the age, in a circumstance where they are facing end of life, correct. I, I and I believe that uh, the younger the patient, the, the more emotional uh, the right. situation becomes. I think that the Terry Schiavo case uh, really uh, illustrates this tremendously. Uh, this, uh, uh, I, and I have seen families go financially broke as well as emotionally broke taking care of severely Absolutely. brain damaged 20-year-olds uh, uh, who they are going to nurse back to health and, and who have no ability to do so. Mm -hmm. I can imagine that's a very difficult situation to face as a doctor mm -hmm. because the family is just hoping beyond hope yes. that there's something that they can do by, by wishing, praying, hoping, and being mm -hmm. there, no. that that blink of the eye means something more than just an autonomic function uh, right. with a damaged brain. Yes, it, 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 it's very sad from my, my perspective. And, uh, um, you know, but I, I also know being a parent that I would, uh, I would go to the end of, my, end of the earth for my kids if, if necessary. And uh, the only way I would stop is if they didn't want me to do it. So I, I've had these conversations with my 29-year-old and 24-year-old sons because I needed to know, and I needed to to hear them say that if they were unable to communicate with me, um, they would not want to. They would not want me to keep them alive under such circumstances. Do they have written advanced directives? <laughs> uh, they do not. I haven't been able to pin them down to do that. But at least we've had the conversation, and I'm very clear about what it is that they that what. Uh, I, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I just you know. <laughs> no, no, but it, but it, but in that sense, it's like I I don't know if the document like I, when I do my advanced care planning, sometimes the documentation is superfluous, and and oftentimes mm -hmm. when after I have my family meetings and we have these discussions, the the the, the documents don't come into play at all because the families know exactly what to do when the doctors ask them. What uh, what kind of treatments we should be pursuing, Doctor? So. To restate again, uh, absent these directives, absent those conversation, what is the default position of the hospital or the facility? Well, in, I think it, it's a state by state uh, uh, regulation. Um, it, it's pretty. I'm, I'm sure it's pretty similar in the, in all states, but in Pennsylvania. Um, we have a algorithm that is dictated by the state that we are to follow. Uh, the uh, the algorithm is that the legal legally legal spouse um, is the first decision maker, is the primary decision maker. Now, if they are remarried, then and it's a second spouse, and they have biological children, the biological children and the second spouse or the current currently married spouse are on equal footing. They, uh, they, they, the Ooh, spouse does not trump yeah. the biological mm. children. Um, and then uh, after that, it's children, um, children or parents, brothers, sisters, cousins. And then, uh, then we are dictated in Pennsylvania to try to find anybody, friends, relatives, right. anybody that would speak uh, to the patient's values if, if there are no blood relatives available. What a horrible position to put someone in. I'm sorry. I said, what a horrible position 
to put someone in to have to make those decisions with substantive judgment and really not know? Uh, yes, uh, and there's there's very good data that and very good studies that have actually shown that this is uh, uh, the people the surrogate decision makers suffer post traumatic stress disorder uh, to the to the order of uh, going to war uh, wow. uh, because mm -hmm. uh, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't um, and it's uh, it's an ex but on the flip side it's you do have an, a, a very strong statement from. The patients as far as what their values are, um, the surrogate decision makers actually feel empowered and they feel um, uh, they, they get gratification out of standing up and doing what is right for their loved one, friend, or, or, or whoever it is. Thank you. Yeah. Carl, this has been an, a most enlightening hour. I, I just can't believe where we've come to the end of it. <laughs> so much information and it just leads to so much more that really needs to be asked i hope in the future yes. time permitting you'll come back and we can elaborate a little bit more on this discussion can you have any last thoughts that you want to leave with our listeners and can you give some contact information should they want to get in touch with you Sure. Well, I, I think that what my the final words would be, uh, please let your loved ones know this mm -hmm. is a very important uh, subject about what level of ability and disability is acceptable and unacceptable to you, and tell and and give them the permission to um, allow you to be comfortable and pass away if you're if you're not living the life that you want to live. Um, and my. Uh, my, uh, you can look at my uh, website, which is carlalswede.com, which is K-A-R-L-A-H-L-S-W-E-D-E.com. And um, um, my uh, email is drcarl at carlalswede.com. And uh, my uh, uh, business number is 484-222-1870. Doctor, thank you so much. It's been a very enlightening hour. It's provided more food for thought uh, than one would have ever imagined, and you certainly have a great grasp of where you're going with this, and you're to be commended. What a great service you've done for our listeners, Doctor. Thank you. Oh, you're yeah. welcome. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. You're welcome. My pleasure. You know, that was, that was quite a conversation. Um, and Antonella, do you have a, a few words yeah. on, on what we just heard? Yeah. Yes, um, actually it's um, a coincidence that we're talking about this and I'm here because I've just lost my nearly one or two years old grandfather. Oh, and uh, lost. Yeah. Right. Condolences. We, thank you. But we were very lucky that, you know, all the family was around. So although maybe there were not all the measures that we have discussed you mm -hmm. know i'm sure that it's so important to have somebody and you don't know if you're gonna have that someone nearby you to know what your wish are uh so it's it's very interesting that there are tools like these that dr carr develop that can help someone right. you know he mentioned the algorithm you know mm -hmm. who can be spoken to Right. And whether you do or do not know the values, I still, at this moment, having watched what our friend Barry went through, yes. which was an identical situation, and his wife's documents, and he mm -hmm. was absolutely adamant that she did not want to continue, and there wasn't anybody from the ethics committee, there wasn't anybody on the medical staff of the mm -hmm. facility that she was in that would do anything more then say, I'm sorry, we'll mm. continue to give her painkillers, and sure. she's going to have to just follow this out. So even in the best of worlds, with the best of intentions, that doesn't necessarily mean that the system is going to line up behind you. And while I right. believe everything that the doctor said and who they would ask, whether or not it will be implemented in a facility setting uh, versus home mm. with hospice, Right. Um, I still have some serious doubts. Particularly if there's Alzheimer's, dementia involved, sure. they're going to err on the side of keeping them alive. Well, I think they're going to mm. err on the side of liability coverage, sure. CYA mm -hmm. coverage, because I don't think that they want to have the one unknown relative come out of the woodwork and say, 
you killed my uncle and I'm going to mm -hmm. sue you, you know, for everything that you're worth. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're coming down to the end. Antonella, I'm sorry that we didn't have more time to speak with you today. I, I really appreciate <laughs> the okay, fact that you came you. in. Paul, I thought your, from my perspective on cancer versus mental health was spot on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, you, yes. you, you've just improved on your perspective week after week after week. I hope that this will be a better week for your wife. Thank you. Antonella, if people want to speak to you, how do they go about doing that? Um, they can call me directly. My phone number is 954-650-2147. Repeat that. 954-650-2147 or they can email me at hcpamerica at gmail.com right. and that's and you do a lot of what the doctor is talking about don't you in your capacity as a PhD pharmacist yes. and advising families and absolutely education and like he stated at the very beginning setting up goals which is you know end of life or getting a quality of life while you do live so yes very important to set up goals good well south florida america in the world i think you heard a lot here tonight that you probably won't hear anywhere else mm -hmm. and we're proud to be able to bring it to you doctor was great antonella you were wonderful Thank as you. always Paul, you look great in your pink tie, <laughs> and you have the concluding words for our audience. Yes, to our wonderful caregivers out there, please take care of yourselves. Um. We'll see you next Tuesday evening. Make it a great week. Thanks for joining us for this week's Caregiver Reality Show. Each week, David Levy, a gerontologist, and Paul Vadiato, a caregiver expert with a combined over 25 years of experience providing practical and realistic help to caregivers struggling to keep up with the needs of a loved one who are unable to care for himself or herself. To reach David Levy, email him at david at caregiverreality.com or to reach Paul Vadiato, email paul at caregiverreality.com. And find out more online. Just go to caregiverreality.com. See you next week for another exciting show of Caregiver Reality.